Even before apps like Runkeeper, Strava and Garmin started offering advice on how to train for a marathon, famous coaches and experts in the field like Jack Daniels, Galloway, Hansen, Higdon, Fitzinger, Waits and Lydiard, all of these offered their own approaches, which were usually based on the author's self-proclaimed decades of experience. With so much choice, why then do so many report difficulty in training for a marathon, particularly their first? The wealth of information available can be a burden rather than a blessing. Two different programs designed for the same marathon finish time can be widely contradictory. To give you an example of how much the training programs of the experts can vary, if we look at the weekly long runs, which are usually considered a core part of any marathon training program. In a 25 week program, Galloway recommends you do a long run every second week. These long runs peak at 32 kilometers, four weeks out from race day. The long runs in Jack Daniel's 18 week program, by contrast, are much shorter, peaking only at 14 kilometers, or less than a third the overall length of a marathon, 10 weeks out from the race. The long runs in Hal Higton's 17-week program are more consistent than those of Galloway, building gradually and peaking at 20 kilometers, four weeks out from the race. And then we have Lydiard's program. Over the course of the last 12 of its 18-week duration, each long run is exactly the same length, 19 kilometers, with no periodization at all. It's important to note that I'm only using this as an example of how much variability there can be in marathon training, how each expert can differ for the core training parameters of what represents a long run. I haven't captured the nuance of the programs themselves either. For instance, all of the experts, Galloway, Daniels, Lydiard, Higdon, and others like Fitzinger and Waits, each recommend different average weekly training distances, different numbers of training days per week, different training paces, and lots of other factors. What you should take from this slide though is that there is no clear systematic or empirical basis for their recommendations. Despite the discrepancy between these programs, they all follow a key principle in training program development known as overload. Basically, this principle states that in order to see progressive gains, you need to progressively increase your training load, the distance or speed of running. But the body has to be given time to rest and recover from a training stimulus. So how can we reconcile this principle of overload with the principle of recovery? With the third principle, one that explains why you can become chronically fatigued or get injured with too much training, but also why with the right balance of training stress and recovery, you can improve performance. This is the Selye Adaptation Principle. The Selye General Adaptation Principle states that when an organism, you, is placed under stress, it undergoes a reaction to that stress, which ultimately results in adaptation or failure if the stressor is prolonged or severe enough. In the case of training for a marathon, all training bouts are perceived by the body as stress, and the key is to ensure that the stress produces positive changes without ever reaching the point of failure or exhaustion. Those positive changes happen in stages. Alarm is the first stage, which is divided into two phases, the shock phase and the anti-shock phase. During the shock phase, your performance will be impaired as the stress must be responded to. So, if you've ever noticed that soon after starting to train, you find that you just seem to be getting worse and worse, you're in the shock phase. This is also why immediately after a session, or even up to two or three days after certain sessions, performance is impaired and you may feel that the training is making you worse rather than better. It's also the reason why rest and recovery are so vital so your body can come back out of the shock phase and enter the anti-shock phase, adapting to the training. Resistance is the second stage. Here, the body attempts to respond to continued stressful stimuli. Muscles grow, they make better use of available oxygen, or they get rid of lactate quicker. Your lungs can breathe more air, and your heart can pump more blood. Your neuromuscular control improves, you get more efficient, your perception of fatigue reduces. After an extended period of training and recovery, your body can reach a plateau. 
it has responded maximally to the training stress and no further improvements in performance occur. Most training programs will either end here or introduce a new stimulus, otherwise you can gradually worsen and eventually fail. If the program has worked successfully, your racing season or your goal race will occur right at the start of the plateau phase and will be followed by a period of inactivity so that a new training program designed to push you beyond the plateau can commence. This is a dangerous period because it precedes the stage known as exhaustion or recovery. Because performance stops improving during the plateau, the temptation is to train harder or faster but this means there is insufficient rest, which only serves to worsen performance. So begins a cycle of deteriorating performance. The goal of a training program then is to ensure that the exhaustion stage is never reached, but rather that you recover sufficiently for the training stress to be altered to cause what is known as a rebound, where performance improves rather than worsens. All of the programs I talked about before are periodized. They go through each of the adaptation stages and include easy weeks to allow you to recover from the training stimulus. But which is the best way to achieve that four hour finish time? The key to answering that question is an understanding of the difference between expert opinion and research evidence. In a broad sense, research evidence is any hypothesis driven systematic observation that is made in order to establish facts and reach conclusions. When it comes to the process of figuring out how to achieve that four hour finish time, systematic reviews and meta-analyses provide a unique opportunity to make a training regimen truly evidence-based. Back in 2018, our research group did exactly that, a meta-analysis of all the available studies in marathon training. This study has undergone peer review and has been published in a well-regarded journal. For a full description of the analysis, you can use the link below. What were our findings? As you might expect, there was a statistically significant relationship between certain characteristics of training and eventual marathon finish time. What's more, there were aspects of training that seemed to play a more important role in overall marathon performance than others. However, the marathon training equation that we came up with was not 100% accurate. If you were to follow the equation for a given finish time, you would not be guaranteed to achieve this time. This is because lots of other variables play a role in determining marathon performance. For instance, a marathoner's pre-race and in-race nutrition strategies, their pacing during the race, and their racing experience are all important contributors to overall performance on race day that are not accounted for in training. So with that in mind, there were eight training parameters for which we were able to draw conclusions. Average weekly running distance, number of weekly runs, maximum running distance in a single week, number of runs that were over 32 kilometers or 20 miles in the entire program, average running pace in training, longest run completed in training, and the number of hours spent running per week. Specifically, our findings would suggest that to achieve that finish time of four hours in the marathon, you would need to run an average of 44 kilometers per week, which would equate with a weekly training commitment of four and a half hours. During your peak week, you would need to run 97 kilometers, and you would need to do at least one 20 mile run during your 12 week training block. Finally, your average pace in training would need to be 1.03 times your marathon pace. So is that all the evidence has to offer? What about interval sessions, resistance exercises? What about rest and periodization? How fast and how far should I run at the start of the program relative to the end? How do I progress and how do I plateau? Unfortunately, the studies either didn't capture these data or didn't report well enough for us to be able to pool their data together to answer those questions. Only two studies reported on the interval style sessions their participants completed, and none reported on resistance training. And only five studies provided any information on training intensity. So while our results provided some insights, if you wanted to sit down and plan out the next 12 weeks of training, say, they don't provide enough detail. So does that mean we're back at square one with the expert opinion programs? Not necessarily. You see, in recent times, with the advent of GPS running watches, millions of runners have been uploading their training and race data to platforms like Strava. 
These data sets are much larger than anything that has been published in the scientific literature and offer potentially unique insights, not about when a runner is formally enrolled in a scientific study, but what they are doing out in the wild. Only recently have these data started to bear fruit in the form of real-world evidence, showing us how runners behave when they're not constrained by a specific research protocol. We'll be talking about that next. <laughs> 